Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson, and I'm here with episode 3 of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. We're pretty much done with the introductory stuff, telling you why we're doing what we're doing. Now we're going to get to some substantive issues in the understanding of Nibbana. And we'll try to clear away a lot of the confusion and get down to the original definition of the terms used to describe Nibbana. Now the first thing to understand about Nibbana, it is that the central theme of the Buddha's teaching, the purpose of the teaching actually, is to attain Nibbana. And if anybody disagrees with that, they have to disagree with the Buddha. And one of the most important aspects in the process of taking Nibbana, or attaining Nibbana, or approaching Nibbana, all of these um, constructions are actually wrong as we will see as we get into this further. But we have to use something. We have to say something about it. So we're using language in a, a colloquial way, not really in a scientific way. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to say anything about it at all. So the first issue we want to bring up is name and form. Dve nama king, namancha rupancha. What is the two? name and form. Now every monk knows this catechism of ten questions which was asked by the Buddha to a young arhant, only seven years old. And all the questions are very deep. What is the one? What is the two? What is the three? So on. So when Buddha asks what are the two? It is name and form. Nama Rupa. Now these are very very simple Pali words, based on Sanskrit words. In fact, they're identical in both languages. Nama means name, and Rupa means form. Very simple, right? <laughs> well, unfortunately, the commentaries on the suttas make a big complicated mess out of this, because they try to say that name means bending. Huh? Because <laughs> By taking a name or identifying a name as a symbol for an object, the mind becomes inclined or bent towards that object. Listen, there's really no need for all this confusion. Nama means name. Name is actually very powerful. And let's take a look here at the uh, process of dependent origination. The red uh, symbols on the left side of the circle are dependent origination, and the green ones on the right are the Noble Eightfold Path. So what's happening here is that we begin from ignorance to fabricate a certain type of consciousness which is experienced in terms of name and form. And this then programs our six senses to have contact with those objects defined by name and form, which creates feelings of pleasurable, unpleasurable, or neutral nature, and that leads to craving for them, or craving against them, whether we like or don't like something. And that leads to clinging. I cling to the things I like, and I also cling to the things I don't like. Then that leads to a process of becoming. In other words, we become the things that we cling to. And that leads to birth, whether it's actual physical birth or the birth of a certain view or personality or other abstraction. And then, of course, that leads to aging and death and suffering. Because we don't like it when things go away, especially if we're clinging to them. But everything in this world has to go away at the end. That's the way the world is. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. So, as long as we cling to the things that we have become and are born into, then we're going to have suffering. So, there are different methods for letting go of this process of becoming, this process of dependent origination. 
and it should be obvious to anybody who thinks about it for a minute, the earlier in the process that we can influence it, then the more power we have over the outcome. Let's use the example of a tree. When a tree is young and supple, it can be bent into various shapes, and indeed people make all kinds of things out of trees um, as an art project or whatever. But once the tree grows high and strong, it can't be bent. And if you try to bend it, you'll break it. So similarly, in the beginning of the process of becoming, we have a great deal of control over how it's going to develop. And the, the later on we wait, the harder it is to change. So even though some methods recommend that we should try to avoid clinging, for example, or we should try to avoid craving, and desire, or even try to avoid feelings, that's not a very powerful way of dealing with the process of becoming. The most powerful way is to deal with the name and form, or the list of things in our minds that we would like to become, or to have happen, or to manifest, however you want to look at it. This is called, in general, ontology. And we have many videos dealing with the process of becoming and the science of ontology in the earlier series. If you haven't gone through those series before listening to this, you're not going to understand what we're talking about. Sorry. So we very highly recommend going back and listening to Matrix Learning and the Foundation series, which is about the process of becoming. That's really the central engine of the teaching of the Buddha. Because by understanding the process of dependent origination, the red uh, labels on the left, we understand how we have come to the place we are at now. How we have become what we wound up being. And by taking that process of dependent origination and turning it into a spiritual path, the Eightfold Path given by the Buddha leads us to the end of becoming. In other words, Nibbana, enlightenment. So, yes, the Eightfold Path is also a process of becoming. But it's a process of becoming that leads to the end of becoming. It leads to the end of uncontrolled manifestation and becoming whatever it is we wound up being instead of what we really wanted to be. Now, the problem is the misinterpretation of the word Nama and Rupa in the commentaries became the standard understanding for later works such as the Abhidhamma. Now I know I'm saying something a lot of fundamentalist Buddhists are going to disagree with by saying that the Abhidhamma came later than the commentaries, but a, a lot of scholarship, a lot of investigations of the history of the Buddha Sasana show that actually it was written later. The Buddha gave central importance to the idea of name as simply name. In fact, there's a nice quote, name has conquered everything. There is nothing greater than name. All have come under the sway of this one thing called name. In other words, delusion operates through language. We have uh, Descartes wonderful quote, I think, therefore I am. Well, yes, I think means I have all these designations, all these names, all these terms, all these identifiers. And then I mix and match and compare and do logical operations on these different identifiers or semantic tags that I attach to my experience. And I call this thinking. But what it really is, is simply the manipulation of symbols through different logical rules. And sometimes we come up with, you know, pretty good answers, but a lot of times we come up with completely false answers as well. Because we're only dealing with semantics. We're not dealing with the things, those semantic 
symbols represent. So, of course, we get out of touch with the reality. And there's another problem. Once we name something, we think we understand what it is. But in fact, everything in this world is constantly changing. So as soon as we label something, maybe the label is, let's, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. You know, maybe the label is correct. Maybe it's accurate. But as soon as we give that label, immediately the thing starts changing. But we're going on and reasoning and thinking and predicting what's going to happen with the same label. We don't change our label. We don't update it huh? until we maybe uh, reach some conclusion regarding this thing that we're talking about. And then we come back and observe it and, oh, wait a minute, it's different. It changed. The cognitive dissonance between what we think the world is and what it really is, is a prime cause of suffering. So every time we come back and look at the results of our thinking versus the reality, we're in for a shock, isn't it? This happens to everybody all the time. So the reason is that we are thinking with abstractions. We're thinking with terminology. Now, there's another good saying by Rockefeller, the original Rockefeller, how to think and grow rich or something like that, that as we think, so we become. So our becoming is actually ruled by our thinking, and our thinking is ruled by our set of names, our ontology, our list of the things that can be or should be or should not be in our world. Yet, even though we strive so hard and we work so hard to make our life into what we want it to be and avoid the things that we don't want, still, we're never successful. And this is this cause of suffering. In a while, we're going to get into the theory of vortexes and how this thinking is actually a vortex created by the obstacle of the ego in the flow of the laws of nature. Now, there's another verse that's often ignored by the commentators. Beings are conscious of what can be named. They are established on the nameable. By not comprehending the nameable things, they come under the yoke of death. Why is this? Because they don't realize that what they don't have names for is beyond their experience. Why is that? Because, remember I said there's pleasurable, displeasurable, and neutral feelings with regard to sense impressions. So what happens when we find something that we like, we want to cling to it. When we find something that we don't like, we want to cling to not having that thing. But what do we do when we encounter something that's neutral? Well, if it's an unknown neutral thing, we tend to view it as displeasurable. But if it's a known neutral thing, we tend to regard it as pleasurable or neutral. And then what do we do? We take that impressions and we trash it. We don't remember it. We may not even experience it directly. We may be totally unconscious of it, even though it's going on in our own mind or our own senses. There's a great example of this from history. When the Spanish Armada appeared off the coast of Central America during the time of the Aztecs, the Aztecs refused to recognize their existence. Why? They had no term in their language for an ocean-going vessel a sailing ship. They had only uh, ore power, human powered fishing boats and canoes and stuff like that. They didn't have sailboats. And then when the Spanish landed with their horses and cavalry and armor and crossbows, these guys had no term to describe or understand these soldiers. 
They could only call them demons and try magical uh, defenses against them. And of course, magic isn't much use against a crossbow shot by an armored soldier riding on a horse. <laughs> Horses were unknown to them. Crossbows, armor, organized military formations were unknown to these people. They had no way to defend against them. They had no way to even perceive them the way they were. They could only run in a blind panic. And, and in this way, about uh, 14,000 mounted troops were able to defeat an army of hundreds of thousands of Mayans and Incas. Now, why was this so? Because they had no names for the things they were encountering. They had no idea, no concept of what these things were. What does this have to do with spiritual life? Nibbana. Everybody's heard of nirvana or nibbana, but who can define it? Who knows what it means? What if everybody had an experience of nibbana every day and didn't know it? Well, it's true. Every night we go to sleep, and after some preliminary dreaming sleep, we go into deep sleep. Uh, it's called uh, non-rem sleep, or Shushupti Marga in Sanskrit. What is this? It is simply an experience of Nibbana without consciousness, without understanding, without knowledge. We need Nibbana. We need the rest, the profound peace, the freedom from outside disturbance that comes from Nibbana. We need this rest or we go crazy. People who are deprived of this deep sleep uh, go crazy in a couple of weeks. Experiments have shown. So every day we're experiencing Nibbana and we don't even know it. We file it under neutral, unknown, trash it. We might remember, oh yeah, I slept really good last night. I had a good rest. But we don't remember anything about it. Because we're not observing. We're not paying attention. We don't think it's important. Because we don't have a name for it that reveals its significance. So this is the power of language. This is why we are so particular about the definitions of terms. Because by a proper definition of terms, we can increase vastly the scope of our knowledge and abilities. Simply by having terminology that relates to the higher experiences of consciousness, the higher range of human thinking and achievement. So it's so important to have this knowledge about how to call things, how to name things, and what they mean. It's very, very important to study semantics and ontology. Unfortunately, we have been miseducated. Uh, we have been taught in such a way that we develop bad feelings about word definitions. And how is that? Because we've been bullied into learning uh, many, many things that we didn't want to learn. So learning has become associated with painful feelings for most of us. Somehow or other, I was able to take responsibility for my own education at a very early date. And I used to read the dictionary for pleasure. And this increased my reading comprehension vastly to the point when, when I was in fifth grade, I was already reading at a college level. So, if you can overcome the conditioning from bad education, you can easily go uh, heal the trauma from your miseducation and then go on to teach yourself anything you want, including how to attain Nibbana and attain it consciously and deliberately whenever you want to or need to. And that is the key to conquering suffering. 
Sukitata, Bhavantu Sukitata.